wonderful. Good night, Guy, and thanks for an awfully nice evening. Good night, darling. See you tomorrow. You haven't the slightest chance of avoiding it. <laughs> Till tomorrow, then. Oh, did I waken you, darling? I meant to be very quiet. Too quiet, my dear. Such overplaying of wifely solicitude might easily be misunderstood. If you're hinting that I was sneaking in... It doesn't matter. Nothing matters anymore. The time has come when words fail to have meaning, when only what one feels is important. I'm going to kill you, Ruth. I have to. No, no! always ends, Doctor. How often have you had these dreams, Mr. Bennett? Oh, five or six times. Every night for the past week, in fact. Have you mentioned them to anyone? To, to your wife, in particular? A recurrent dream in which I brutally beat my wife with a perfume bottle is hardly a cheerful topic for the breakfast table. Hardly. Are they always the same? Always. What is your profession, may I ask? I'm a writer of the better type of fiction, I hope. Well, isn't it entirely possible that this dream, as you call it, is merely the subconscious development of another story plot? I rarely, if ever, dwell on the macabre, Dr. Redmond. Mr. Bennett, I'm going to ask you some personal questions. Now, you understand, of course, that anything said here will be treated in the strictest confidence. Well, I don't know. I... Miss Kramer's entirely trustworthy. She's been with me four years. So I should know. Very well, Doctor. I'll do my best. Well, first, how is your health? Physically, I'm quite fit. Mentally? Mentally, I'm frightened to death. Doctor, do you think it possible that I might uh, slip my cable some night and... Actually murder your wife? Yes. It's possible. Fortunately, you had the good sense to take the matter in hand in time. Now tell me. Are you unduly worried about anything? I'm worried about this dream. I suppose you'd call it a fear dream. There's no such thing as a fear dream, Mr. Bennett. There are only wish dreams. Are you telling me that I wish to kill my wife? Well, not consciously, perhaps. But your subconscious mind could be entertaining such a thought. Nonsense. I love my wife. Perhaps. And all men kill the thing they love. Some do it with a bitter look, some with a flattering word. Or a quart-sized perfume bottle? Less romantic, but just as practical. Your reasoning is quite as bad as your rendition of Wilde, Dr. Redmond. I resent them both equally. I apologize for the poetry, but not for my reasoning, Mr. Bennett. Does your wife return your affection? It is my honest conviction that she hates me thoroughly. Faithful? Is she? I wouldn't know. Perhaps you covet your wife's jewelry. Now, wouldn't I look fine walking about with $100,000 worth of jewelry adorning my person? 
You could convert that jewelry into cash if you happen to need money. Do you? Frankly, yes. However, I can always get an advance from my publisher. Anything else? Would you like to know the color of my father's hair or my favorite breakfast dish? Kippers, if that's any help. That's all for today, thanks. But I would like you back again on Thursday at 4. I suppose I can manage it. Uh, by the way, Mr. Bennett, do you occupy a bedroom with your wife? Not a care, Doctor. I mention it merely as a precaution. Sleep in the guest room if you have one. You can make some excuse. I grasp your point. Yes, I think I can manage it. Good. See you on Thursday. Thank you. I must have a talk with his wife. Uh, call her, please, and if she isn't in, leave word that it's imperative that I see her at once. Tonight, if possible. Yes, sir. I hope you didn't mind my little lie. About the four years? Well, if I'd said you'd been with me only four weeks, I'd have scared him off. Doesn't matter. Now look here, Merrick. It isn't as though I was some inconsequential pulp scribbler asking for a handout. This is Alton Bennett speaking. I've got to have at least $10,000. Is that your final answer? I'll send you plenty of time. Oh, really, I really should get oh, away. Oh, come in for a minute. Oh, oh, hello. Have a good day. Excellent. How about you, Baird? Any luck? Not bad, considering that we only got there in time for the last two races. Guy won $180 on a horse, simply because he liked the arch of his neck. That's me. Always the architect, thinking in terms of lines. <laughs> Sit down, Gus. Thanks. You arrived only in time for the last two races? Yes, we uh, drove down to the beach property first. Again. Well, we thought it best to have another look at the building site. It was a wonderful day, really. Wasn't it, Guy? It certainly was. I hope you know what you're doing, my dear. I know exactly what I'm doing. I'm building a beach house for my husband. So you'll have a nice, quiet place to work. Really? I was under the impression that you were doing it to provide Mr. Baird with an architect's commission. Oh, look here. Pay no attention to him, Guy. He's showing you his better side. After four drinks, he's really detestable. I'll be running along now, if you don't mind. Not at all. And, uh, don't forget these. They're beginning to look a little frayed, aren't they? What is the life expectancy of a set of blueprints, anyway? Sorry. Pick us up at eight, Guy. We're stopping by the Mallory's first for cocktails. All right. You're in excellent form tonight. I'm looking forward to a most enjoyable evening. I'm sorry to disappoint you, but I'm not going. You don't expect me to stay at home? Oh, no, my dear. I wouldn't dream of depriving you of the opportunity of making a vulgar display of yourself. Go ahead. Deck yourself out like some cheap little carnival biddy. You're so obvious. You hate my jewels because you can't have them. Stop encouraging Bayard. In what way? Well, you know I haven't the money to build this beach place. You've got to forget it. Oh, that. I thought you were going to say I had to stop seeing Guy.
Hello, Pumpkin. Do you miss me? I love you. 7.30. Time to go to sleep. Good night, darling. Kitten. Come on in. Thanks. How are you tonight? Tired. Oh, maybe you don't feel like a show. My feelings have nothing to do with it. Dr. Redmond wants me back at the office at 9 o'clock for an interview. Again? What's the matter with that boss of yours? Doesn't he have a home? He hasn't much of one now. His wife is still in Santa Barbara. Why don't you take off your coat and relax while I fix us something to eat? Well, I won't have time to go out. You like chow mein? Like it? I invented it. Good. Turn on the radio or play a record or something. Thanks. Coffee or tea? Oh, tea sounds swell. Crackpots today? Our clients are not crackpots. They're mental cases. Okay, mental cases. How many wives with guilty consciences did you interview? None. Today was husband's guilty conscience day. There was one in particular that was out of the ordinary. Yeah? He uh, dreams every night that he beats his wife to death with a perfume bottle. Oh, I suppose that means he's suffering from a suppressed hatred of his mother-in-law or something. Dr. Redmond seems to think that he has his wife's jewels on his mind. Subconscious mind, that is. They're worth $100,000. It's why I've got to go back to the office tonight. The doctor wants to have a talk with his client's wife. Can't you put something on a little less nerve-shattering? Sure. Anything new in the detective business today? Well, the fellow came in to see me about framing his wife for a divorce action. You couldn't be such a heel. Why not? It's a legitimate racket. Racket is right. Next thing you know, you'll be stealing pennies from blind old ladies. The blind old ladies I know don't have any pennies. You should have stayed on the police force. At least you were in good company. There's no future in it. When you're 43, you make sergeant. Three eighteen a month. Uh-uh. That isn't money. Well, I guess you're old enough to know what you're doing. Sure I know what I'm doing, kitten. I'm after fancy dough. I'll show you what I mean when I get paid off for a job I did last month. That reminds me, honey, I almost forgot something. Will you give me five minutes? Yes, but not any longer, because 
things will be ready then. Word of honor, kitten. Five minutes. Papers, papers. Get your papers. Daily Globe. Paper, mister. Paper, paper. The last edition, paper. Paper, paper. The last edition, paper. Open up, Jeremy. Make impressions of these quickly, Charlie. Car 61A, a 390, 636 Liberty Street, assaulting a woman. Car 12R, out to City Hall of Records. Car 14, what is your location now? I'll be back for the duke later. Car 135T, can you handle the call? Car 43, out to the station. Car 135T, Amsterdam and 63rd, traffic accident. Papers! Paper! Get your paper here, paper! Paper, yes sir! How am I doing, kitten? Hold you up? You're just in time. The chow mein's ready. Have to hurry or I'll be late. Yeah. Why, Carl, how nice. Now I'd better step on it. You want me to stick around? You'd better not. It'll be pretty late. Thanks for walking over with me. The pleasure's all mine, kitten. <laughs> You'd better come with me, Guy. I've never met this Dr. Rhythm before. All right. Thursday. Thank you, Miss Kramer. You may go. And uh, put the Bennett folder back in the files, please. Yes, sir. Well, Mrs. Bennett, what do you make of it? Oh, the whole thing's too ridiculous for words. Alton simply ate something that didn't agree with him and passed a bad night or two. I do the same thing occasionally. And do you dream of murdering your husband, Mrs. Bennett? Oh, often. Even when I'm not asleep. No, Dr. Redman, I'm not afraid of my husband. There's nothing wrong with him that a good night's sleep and a royalty check won't cure. Believe me. Good night. Good night, Mrs. Bennett. Well, what's it all about if I'm not being too personal? It seems that my husband is troubled by a recurrent dream in which he beats my brains out with a perfume bottle. You don't mean it. At least that's what this Dr. Redmond, or whatever his name is, says. Rather frightening, isn't it? I've heard of such things, but this is the first time I've ever... You don't think there's any truth in what that man says, do you? How would I know? Does he have any explanation for this dream your husband is having? Yes, something about Alton wanting my jewels. You mean they're real? Well, they're insured for a hundred thousand. A hundred thousand? Oh, 
what do you know? <laughs> and all the time I thought there were five in dime glitter. Hmm. Just to make the lady look pretty. You make me feel like a corpse already. I'm sorry, I, I didn't mean to. Well, I have a feeling I'm going to drink much too much tonight. Hall, eh, Charlie? Well? What do you say, Charlie? Well, these little ones, I'll give you $1,100. But what about the other pieces? <laughs> if you're smart, you'll dump them in the nearest ash can. What's the matter with you, Charlie? You going crazy? Just playing it safe, kid. There's a murder rap hanging over this chunk. What do you mean? That's right. Murder. Over at the Crayford Arms. Yeah. A load of fancy rocks is missing. I heard it on the police call. They'll have a list of everything. Well, you got nothing to worry about, Charlie. I didn't murder anybody for this ice. I ain't saying you did. I'm just saying this junk is hot. They're specially designed pieces, and they're registered by some insurance company. You can bet on that. Get rid of them. That's my advice. Stop playing me for a dope and give me the 1100. Play it smart, like I said, fast. You're not talking to a cluck, Charlie. You're talking to a guy who knows all the angles. I got everything all planned out. Very, very carefully. But you only borrowed five. It's interest, baby. Buy yourself a present. You know, you're not half the heel you pretend to be, Carl. Well, you've only known me six weeks. Wait. Well, the extra five will make a payment on a coat I've been buying. You can have it back anytime you need it. Oh, I won't need it. I'm loaded. That client I was telling you about paid off this morning. It's burning a hole in my pocket. <laughs> You'll find a way to spend it. That's what I'm afraid of. Oh, kitten. You got a bank account? Yes, I've batted up savings. Then do me a favor, baby. Put this away for me and dole it out as I need it. There's a grand here. A thousand dollars? Are you sure you... Of course I'm sure. If I hold on to it, I'm liable to go on a binge and blow it all at once. You keep it for me. Well, okay. I'll deposit it during my lunch hour. Well, bye, kitten. Bye.
like I say, if you'll stop using the car long enough, I can get the brakes fixed. What do people do, stand around and wait for a murder? I'm sure all these people... Dawson, homicide. They've been waiting for you. Yeah, I know. I grabbed a couple hours sleep last night. I won't let it happen again. Stale. Homicide, too. Photo. Fingerprint. All right, stand back, folks. Come on. Dawson, homicide. Don't fool around with that. Let's get upstairs and get the bedroom stuff. Hey, now. No, sir. Come on. You can't come up here. You heard what the officer said. You almost see downstairs. Why does everybody hear about these things before we do? Well, is this strictly an invitational affair? Or can anybody horn in? Where's Wilson? Here, Lieutenant. I was just locking the service door to keep anybody from leaving. Oh, are you sure everybody's here? We don't want to overlook anyone, do we? You're Alton Bennett, I take it. You take it correctly. I'm Lieutenant Dawson, Homicide Bureau. That does not excuse your bad manners. Kindly take off your hat and stop shouting. Oh, sorry. Lieutenant, coroner's deputy's here in the ambulance. Okay. Would you mind taking us upstairs, Mr. Bennett? All right. Henry, would you get me another cup of coffee? Yes. Come along, coroner. In that. Stick here, Sergeant. Keep that mob outside. It's about time you were getting on the job, Dawson. It's him, all right. No, not you again. It so happens that my company holds a policy on the lady's jewels. Okay, Cooper, if there is a stick pin missing, you'll be notified through the proper channels. Now beat it, your slip's showing. Okay, fellas, get to work. See if you can establish the time, darn. A hundred thousand dollar policy, Lieutenant. And the jewels are missing. That perfume bottle was undoubtedly the lethal weapon. I have a hunch you'll find some interesting prints on it. Thanks for the apple. What time was your wife's body discovered, Mr. Bennett? About 7.30 this morning. By you? No, by the maid. Who was the first to notice that the jewels were missing? The maid. I was too, too shocked to notice anything. Who else was in the house at the time? The butler, Henry. Ask them both to come here. Was your wife wearing her jewelry last night? Yes. You're sure? Of course I'm sure. Can you remember the exact number of pieces that Quiet, she Quiet, Cooper. Did you sleep in this room last night, Mr. Bennett? No. Neither bed has been used, as you can see for yourself. Mm. Well, where did you sleep? In the guest room, down the hall. Did you see your wife come in? No. Did you hear her come in? No, I... I was sleeping too soundly. When was the last time you saw your wife wearing her jewels, Mr. Bennett? I think it was about 8.30 when they left the house, wasn't it, Christine? Yes, sir. Who do you mean, they? My wife and a Mr. Guy Bayard. Friend of the family? Not exactly. He's an architect whom my wife had engaged to design a beach house. I see. Where can he be reached? Well, I think he has an office in the Swope Studios in Chatham Place. Are you in the habit of sleeping in the guest room, Mr. Bennett? Uh, no, I usually share this room with my wife. What made you decide to sleep in the guest room last night? I... I haven't been sleeping too well lately. I... You may as well know the truth. You'll dig it out sooner or later. I slept in the guest room because I was afraid. Afraid of what? Of myself. I've been having horrible nightmares lately. Terrible dreams in which I murder my wife. With a perfume bottle? 
Yes, I... That's why I knew, before I went in there, what I'd find. Ruth and a crumpled heap on the floor, and beside her head, the perfume bottle. It was horrible. Worse even than the dreams. That's why I went to Dr. Redmond. Those dreams were driving me crazy. I was afraid of losing my mind or of doing her some harm in my sleep. Thank heaven I know it wasn't me. How do you know? I wasn't able to sleep. I asked Henry to bring me the sleeping tablets. Two would ordinarily be sufficient, but I was desperate for relief. I took four. Anybody witness it? Henry. Yes, sir. I, I even cautioned him about taking so many, but he took them just the same. Any of those tablets left? Yes, sir. I put the bottle in the cabinet. Get it. I'd say she's been dead about six hours, Lieutenant, which would place the time of the slaying around uh, 2.30. There'll be an inquest, of course, Mr. Bennett. Naturally. There's not much to go on. Some prints on the perfume bottle other than Mrs. Bennett. We'll check them downtown. You'll probably find them mine. I... When I went in there this morning, I, I picked it up and looked at it. I started to put it on the dressing table, and in my nervousness, it hit the edge of the table and slipped from my grasp. Wait outside. When necessary, take one for relief. Take two... In this dream of yours, Mr. Bennett, did you have any particular reason for murdering your wife? Jealousy? Her jewels? You know what I mean? None that I could ever recall. That's why I went to Dr. Redmond. I thought he might help me. In other words, you wanted to make sure that your story of the dream was put on the record. I don't like the insinuation, Mr. Dawson. I went to Dr. Redmond, a psychiatrist, for help. Not, as you seem to imply, to establish an alibi. In a murder case, Mr. Bennett, anybody that crossed your wife's path is a suspect. I may want to talk to you again. You mean I'm not under arrest? Not yet. But until these tablets have been analyzed, I wouldn't leave town if I were you. Get Bennett's prints. Check them at headquarters. Yes, sir. Cover the maid and the butler, too. What have you got to say, Lieutenant? Is Bennett guilty? Your guess is as good as mine. What's the name of the boyfriend she was out with? Guy Bayard, an architect. What's Bennett's alibi? Overdose of sleeping tablets. <laughs> you guys want an angle? Yeah, yeah, sure. This is a dilly. Bennett claims he dreamed he murdered his wife every night last week. So he went to a psychiatrist to find out what it meant. Oh, boy. <laughs> hey, boss. You take it here. Maybe I'll have time to get the brakes fixed now. Stick here. Sure, Lieutenant. That says private. It's about time, Lieutenant. The doc doesn't feel so hard. I just broke the bad news. That's very kind of you, Mr. Cooper. I don't know what I'd do without you. This is Lieutenant Dawson, homicide, Dr. Redmond. I can't believe it. It's, it's too fantastic. And yet I had a feeling this was going to happen. That's why I called Mrs. Bennett here, to put her on her guard. Sergeant Fail, homicide too. About that dream of Bennett's, Dr. Redmond, did you keep a transcript of it? Well, yes, in my files. But I may as well tell you that the transcript is missing. Well, who has access to your files besides yourself? My secretary, Miss Kramer. Where is she? I sent her home. She had a bad headache. I wasn't feeling too well either, so I canceled my appointments and let her go. Where does she live, Doc? Uh, on Green Street, just off Broome, 414, I think. How long has she been gone? Mm, nearly half an hour. Did that have anything to do with canceling your engagements? Well, uh, yes, it did. I. Had a little accident last night. That's what I'd like to hear about, Doc. Last night. Where were you between midnight and, say, 4 a.m. this morning? At home in bed. Can you prove it? <laughs> be more difficult for you to prove that I wasn't. <laughs> when Bennett told you his dream, Doctor, did you get the feeling that he was interested in his wife's jewels? Well, he considered them vulgar, well, at least in bad taste. Well, well was Mrs. Bennett wearing her jewelry when she came here last night? Will you close your trap about those jewels? When we find the murderer, we'll find the jewels. And vice versa, maybe. Quiet. 
How did you get that bump on your head? Well, after my interview with Mrs. Bennett, I went for a walk. And crossing Gramercy Park, I slipped and struck my head. Well, speaking of Mrs. Bennett, uh, was she alone? No, she was with a Mr. Bayard. Well, uh, where was he while you were talking with Mrs. Bennett? In here. Could he have heard anything that was said between you two? Well, I'm not sure. The door was closed. We go in there and say a few words in a conversational tone, just the way you were talking with Mrs. Bennett. Close the door after you. And sit in the same chair, too, please. Now, all kidding aside, Cooper, who tipped you off? It's like I told you, Bill, I had your desk wired. If I ever find a leak in my office, somebody's gonna lose that job. Well, don't look at me. Now, don't get your ulcers in an uproar, Bill. The desk clerk at the Crayford Arms is a friend of mine. He tipped me off the moment the call went through. Until this dream period is over, Mrs. Bennett, I advise you not to antagonize your husband. I'm afraid you don't realize how serious his condition is. You hear me? We heard you all right, every word. Okay, Doc, that takes care of you for a while. Now, about this secretary of yours, how long has she worked for you? Four weeks. What kind of references did she have? Excellent. Still got them? I think so. Uh, yes. Here they are. Well, you know anything about her family? No, nothing. She came from Los Angeles. Well, it's funny you'd hire a strange girl you didn't know, and give her access to the secrets of those files without thoroughly checking on her references first. What are you driving at? They're forged, all signed by the same hand. I don't believe it. Whether you believe it or not, it's true. You're not going to bother Miss Kramer, are you? Why not? Well, good heavens, man, surely you know who killed Ruth Bennett. No. Who? Why, her husband. Did you hear that, Coop? The doc here said... Where is that guy? Well, what are you standing there for? Let's go. Hey, Bill, read all about it. Hey, Bill, hey, Bill. Read all about it. We're just lucky, that's all. Hey, how about this? Talk to him. He's the driver. Hey, what are you taking the guy on me for? You can't fool around with these taxi cab companies. They'll screw you. They'll screw the city, but with me. Here I am, standing here, minding my own business. And these cops come along. I ain't mad at anybody. Believe me, I'm not. And now, what am I going to do about the boss? It's the third time this week I got hit. I'm sure I'm going to have to get paid. I know that. B. Hey, C3. Oh. I'm the guy they call on the carpet. They don't blame you for... Thank you. Wasn't that Cooper? Now look here, Cooper, you... I beg your pardon. Well, won't you come in? Thanks. Miss Kramer, may I present my colleague and bosom companion, Lieutenant Dawson of Homicide, Lieutenant. Miss Kramer. I'm pleased to meet you, Miss Kramer. How do you do? Sergeant Fail, Homicide, too. You'll have to excuse the place. This is cleaning day. Won't you sit down? Thanks. Dr. Redmond said he sent you home with a bad headache. I'm glad it's better. Yes, I... Uh... I feel much better since I had a cup of coffee. And very good coffee, too, I might add. I suppose Chum here has told you the news. 
I was shocked to hear about Miss Bennett. She was a beautiful woman. Uh, how long have you... You can skip the preliminaries, Lieutenant. Miss Kramer has already given me the pertinent facts, such as age, birthplace, favorite sports, likes Gershwin, and that she's not married. I'll do the questioning for the police department. You just stick to your insurance investigating. Thank you, Mr. Cooper. Who had access to those files besides you and Dr. Redmond, Miss Kramer? No one. Uh, what time did you get home last night? Oh, about... Ten. Were you the last one to leave the office? Dr. Redman and I left together. You came from Los Angeles, didn't you, Miss Kramer? That's right. Who'd you work for out there? Oh, several different people, firms. I, I see. Well, why did you come here? Well, I, uh, I got tired of California. I wanted a change, that's all. Everyone needs a change once in a while. You might try it yourself sometime. Just what do you want to know, Mr. Dawson? Just one thing, Miss Kramer. When you came here to look for a job... Uh, yes? Were you running away from something? No. Then why did you have to forge references? Forged? Yeah, Junior. You got a bad habit of running off too soon. You ought to learn to stick around. Well, Miss Kramer? Get out, Mr. Dawson. You too, Mr. Cooper. Okay. But those references were forged, Miss Kramer. And crudely at that. I was hoping you'd explain without forcing my hand. I don't want to book you on suspicion of murder unless you make me. But there's nothing to explain. I, I had to leave California in a hurry. I needed a job and I couldn't get one without references, so I had some made up. Well, how'd you get the job with Dr. Redmond, Miss Kramer? Through a friend of mine who lives right here in this building. What's your friend's name? Benson. Carl Benson. He lives right down on the second floor front, 2A. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Miss Kramer. Come on, Sergeant. I'm sorry. I wish that there was... There isn't. See you again sometime. I hope. Well, do you still think she makes good coffee? I thought her explanation for those references made pretty good sense. <laughs> Don't let those limpid orbs of hers throw you, son. She hasn't told half of what she knows yet. Oh, we might as well check with a friend while we're here. Wait downstairs. Hey, do you think I'd have time? No, I guess not. You Carl Benson? Yeah. I'm Lieutenant Dawson, homicide. This is Joe Cooper, investigator for underwriters casualty. Well, glad to know you, Lieutenant. You too, Cooper. How are you? Sit down, grab a chair. Here. Thanks. You mind if I finish shaving? Go ahead. What can I do for you fellas, if anything? You know the Kramer girl upstairs? Sure. Nice kid. Not too bright, maybe, but a very sweet personality. Why? Know anything about her background? Well, not much. She moved in here about six weeks ago. You ever hear her say anything about servant time? Nah, she's straight. What's the matter? Oh, nothing. I was just thinking about some water. What do you use for a... Oh, I got it. Here, let me fill it up for you. No, never mind. I don't like that faucet water. You writing a bond or something on her, Cooper? No, I'm working on the Bennett case. Maybe you heard about it. Oh, yeah. I was just reading about it in the paper. The Bennett dame got knocked off. Yeah, that's right. I get it. Your company holds the policy on the missing ice? Yeah. Say, in case you didn't know it, this thing stopped up. Well, it's probably empty. I'd never touch it myself. No, there's water in it, all right. It's full right up to here. Here, let me pour you a real drink. Now, skip it. How do you figure the kid upstairs in this? You got her a job with Dr. Redmond, didn't you? Yeah, that's right. I heard about the opening and took her up. For a slight commission. Any idea who fixed up her references? No. Why? They were phony. Phony? How do you like that? Say, you don't think the kid's mixed up in the murder, do you? 
Well, she had access to the files, and she knew about the dream. She and Bennett and Redmond. And Baird. Don't overlook him. Say, maybe you got something. Maybe that's the way to lay your dough. Straight across the board on Baird, the dame's boyfriend. Look, if I get a lead on this case and help break it, will underwriters casually pay off? You? Yeah, sure. I used to be on the force. I'm in business for myself now, in a small way, private investigations. Ask him. How about it? Oh, I'm in no position to commit the company, but I suppose they'd pay up to 10% on $100,000, the insured value of the jewelry. Uh, well, who can laugh at 10 grand? This is where I go to work. I'm sure glad you fellas dropped in. Always glad to talk shop with some of the boys. I'll be seeing you. Yeah. So long. So long, then. So long, Cooper. Drop in, uh, anytime. Heard you vacuum. How come you're home today? Dr. Redmond wasn't feeling very well. He canceled all of his appointments and gave me the day off. May I come in? You don't mind if I go on with my work? No. Go right ahead. They didn't try to push you around, did they? Who? Those dicks. Did they talk to you too? Yeah, they tried to pump me, as if I'd put out anything. I told them you were a straight kid. Well, there's nothing else you could say under the circumstances, is there? Oh, I wouldn't have anyway, kitten. Not for all the tea in China. Thanks, that makes us even. Because I didn't tell them that you furnished me with the forged references either. You know what I think? No, what? I think the husband bumped her off, don't you? I don't care whether he did or he didn't. I've answered all the questions I'm going to for one day, Carl. Now, will you please leave so I can finish my work? Sure, kid. Sorry, I bothered you. You want anything from uptown? No, thanks. If those dicks come around again, tell them to get lost. I'm sorry I'm so grumpy. It's okay. Be seeing you. Got. Photostatic copies of the Bennett woman's jewelry taken from the insurance policy. I've had copies distributed to all the pawn shops, and if just one piece of that turns up, we're set. You mean to tell me a woman wore all that junk on her at one time? Well, it's disgusting, but true. I got Bayard inside. Let's hear his story. Give us an overall picture of your movements, Mr. Baird, from the time you went out with Mrs. Bennett till, say, around 6 in the morning. Well, no reason why I shouldn't. I called for the Bennetts around 8.20 and learned from Mrs. Bennett that her husband wasn't going. 
I'd gathered that had uh, words over it. Anyway, we went to the Mallory's for cocktails, and Mrs. Bennett asked me to go along with her to Dr. Redmond's office. She had been in gay spirits until after we left there, but then she became moody and wanted to drink. But did you hear what Dr. Redmond said to Mrs. Bennett? Enough to know they were discussing a husband. It wasn't until after we left that she told me about the dream business. I might add, she seemed rather frightened. Well, where'd you go then? Back to the Mallory's, but Ruth thought it was dull and got up a party to go night clubbing. We went to the Blue Heron. Go on. Well, Mrs. Bennett got kind of high and made such a scene that the management asked us to leave. Now, look here, Bear. Just a minute, Mr. Bennett. Go on. I don't drive myself, so I put her in a cab and took her home. However, she kept arguing until she... She got me worked up to the point where, well, frankly, I could have cheerfully throttled her. When we got to her apartment house, I think it was around 2 o'clock, I told the driver to wait and took her in. She had a little trouble finding a key and wouldn't let me help her. Finally, she found it and I opened the door. the elevator. She still wanted to argue, but I, I left her there and went out. I got in the cab and drove away. That was the last time I saw her, Lieutenant. Well, where'd you go then? Home. Was Mrs. Bennett wearing these when you left? Yes, I recognized most of them. All except that signet ring there, but should hardly be wearing that. Hardly. Did anybody see you take Mrs. Bennett home? There was a fellow in the lobby talking to a girl. I believe he lived there. I've seen him several times. He might have recognized me. Recall his name? I don't believe I ever heard it. Well, I guess that's about all, for the time being at least. Thanks for coming down, Baird. Not at all. lying about Ruth. I've never known her drink to excess. Well, you could check his story at the Blue Heron easy enough. I shall. And if Guy Baird is lying, he shall answer to me, not to the police. <laughs> the more I see of him, the more I feel he's putting on a terrific act. If I just had one good bit of evidence. That signet ring, Bill. Mrs. Bennett wasn't wearing it, and yet it's missing. Now, only three people knew where she kept her jewelry. Her husband, the maid, and the butler. You can toss out the last two. They go home at night, and I've checked their story. It's airtight. Well, so is Bennett's. I had those sleeping pills analyzed, and four of them would knock you out like a snoot full of ether. Unless maybe the system had become immune from repeated doses, and according to the butler, that wasn't the case with Bennett, Dawson. Yeah? Yeah, well... Yes, yeah, Stell, but of course I'm busy, Stell. Well, why don't you send Judy? Oh, she's practicing the piano. Well, no, no, don't stop her. Let her get it over with before I get home. Yeah? Yeah, bread? Yeah. Pound of tomatoes? Ground round. Yes, I'm writing it down, Stell. Yeah, goodbye. Immune, Bill, immune. You got something. Yeah, I have. I got a headache. Well, good night, fellas. Good night, right. fellas. I'm going home. Ground, round, tomatoes. Bill, come over bread. to the police dispensary with me first. I got an idea. Ah, it's too late for ideas, son. I want to get a good night's sleep. It'll only take a minute now. Come on. Yeah. Yes, yeah, Dell. Well, sure, but I. But just ground round. Well, yeah, I thought it was something round. Well, sure, I wrote it down, Stell, but. Okay, be home right away. Look, Doc, this catalytic agent business is all very interesting. But if you don't mind, forget it a minute. Now, what we want to know is this. Could Bennett have taken anything before he took the sleeping pills to counteract their effect? Say, you know, that's a very interesting point you bring up. Now, will you step on it, Doc, please? You know, the butcher shop's closed at 6 o'clock. How many sleeping tablets did Bennett take? He took four. Mm-hmm. Yes, if he had taken two Benzedrine tablets, five milligrams each, before taking the sleeping tablets, the sleeping tablets wouldn't have had any effect on him whatsoever. 
Well, then Bennett's our man. The doc here has just busted his alibi wide open. Yeah, but did you ever hear of this stunt being pulled before? No, but I'm sure it's possible. Have you got any of these Benzedrine tablets handy, Doc? Oh, sure, we have some of them. Well, then let's try it on me. I don't mind being a guinea pig. Where are they, Doc? Oh, well, I got them right here, but I got to make out a prescription, you know. Uh, here we are. There, two Benzedrine. <clears throat> you know, Bill, this is very, very interesting. In all the years that I've been in the dispensary, I don't remember a case like this coming up, do you? Yeah, it'd be very interesting if I got home without the groceries. <laughs> Now, where are those sleeping pills that you analyzed for Bill? Oh, I got them right here. Let's see, uh, yeah, Exhibit 22C. Can I have four of them? Oh, well, okay, Bill? Well, yeah, give them anything he wants. All right, there you are. Four. Will you join me, Lieutenant? I don't mind if I do. If they're on the house. Sure. But you can skip the Benzedrine. I want to get a good night's sleep. <laughs> Now we'll see if Bennett could have stayed awake in spite of his having had those sleeping pills. <laughs> now, if you fellas will excuse me, I'll go home and get a good night's sleep. What are you doing here? Oh, there's a pawn shop on Green Street that reports picking up a piece of the Bennett jewels. There. I thought I'd tell you. You thought? Well, what are you waiting for? Let's go. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Doc. We'll let you know how this makes out. Right. See you later. It's one of Mrs. Bennett's, all right. The family crest ring. What name did she give? Jane Smith. But that doesn't mean anything. That's a popular name in a pawn shop. Have uh, ever seen her before? No, but I got an idea. She lives in the neighborhood. She was carrying a black and white uh, striped jacket and a black skirt on the cleanest hanger. Uh, that's an idea, son. We'll search every cleaning establishment in the neighborhood. I'll take care of this. Let's trouble with you. You feel sleepy. Oh, I feel fine. I took Benzedrine first, remember? No, I'm sorry, but we haven't had a black and white sports jacket lately. Why don't you take your friend home and let him sleep it off? That's a good idea, ma'am. Come on, Father. Curfew is ringing. Uh, sort of a black and white sport outfit. Black and white sport outfit. Yes, I remember that. Yes, it went out this afternoon. Very nice young lady. Bill, do you hear that? Have you got the lady's name and address? Let's see. Yes, uh, Kramer is the name. She lives up the street in the brownstone, second from the corner. What did I tell you, kid? An inside job. <laughs> Come on. Uh, if you don't mind, I'd like to take along that slip. It's all yours. Thanks. Hey, fellas, come and get him. Take him home and put him to bed. Let him sleep it off. Hey, he's gonna be hopping mad. He missed his dinner. He's gonna be hopping mad. He missed the Kramer girl. I'll phone the old buzzer tomorrow. Phil, tell him. Don't let him out of your sight. Sure, Sergeant. I never knew the boss to take a drink. I don't get it. Come on, Lieutenant. Let's go. Coat. It's very pretty. Thanks. Well? I'd like to talk to you for a bit. Won't you? Uh, excuse me a minute.
What do you think? She's lovely. You know, there's a look about the eyes that... She's my, uh... Well, I was going to say she's my baby, but she's quite a young lady now. Three years old. You're very lucky. I think I am. Where is she now? In California with my mother. I'm going to bring her here as soon as I can afford to. Well, Mr. Cooper, what is it you wanted to talk to me about? Lots of things, including the Bennett case. But why don't we gab over a plate of spaghetti? I know a nice... Nice, quiet little Italian place right near here. <laughs> Who doesn't? How about it? All right. Everything is all right? Fine, thanks. Say, there's a copper named Wilson hanging around outside. Take him a sandwich or something with my compliments. See, si, subito. Sit around. Thank you. The boys at the Homicide Bureau are really beginning to take you seriously. What about you? Well, I was wondering if I wasn't taking you too seriously myself. You said you weren't married, and so I... You didn't bring me here to ask me about that, did you? No, not altogether. I wanted you to straighten me out on a few things. For instance? This, for instance. Did you ever see it before? Well, that's a ring I found in my apartment. Where did you get it? From the pawnbroker. He notified the police department the moment it turned up. You mean? To recoin an old bromide, it's part of the missing Bennett loot. Oh. When did you find it? This afternoon, when I was cleaning my apartment. I showed it to the landlady, but she didn't know who it belonged to. I then I asked Carl, and he said it was worth eight or ten dollars, so... So? Well, I only owed eight dollars more in this coat I'm wearing, and... You believe me, don't you? Yes, I believe you, but the question is, will Dawson? He's a tough nut to crack once he gets his mind set. And he has his mind set on me? Well, he thinks you're mixed up in it somewhere. Mrs. Bennett's murder? Oh, that doesn't mean a great deal. Dawson suspects everybody until he finds the guilty party. Now, who was in the apartment today besides you, Dawson, and myself? Carl. Carl Benson, the fellow I told you about. And who else? Mr. Bennett. Oh? What was he doing there? Well, from what I could gather, he was checking up on his wife's movements the night she was murdered. Were they there before or after you found the ring? Before, I think. You sure? Yes, I'm sure. Good. You know, we better be going if we want to catch that second show. Well, I told you how she got the ring. Oh, please, Chum. You're not going to swallow that story about finding it in the chair. Tell me that was you who just knocked on that door there. Well, who'd you think it was? Well, I didn't think. I just left, but quick. How are you, Dawson? Okay. Come on in. Thanks. Hiya, fellas. How you doing, Benson? Fine. It's 
Maxwell. Well, thanks. What were you looking for? Anything in particular? No, just snooping. Find anything interesting? Well, underwriters casually might just as well fork over that ten grand right now. You mean you found a lead? The dame showed me a gold signet ring. Said she found it in the overstuff there. Oh, well, what about it? Oh, it's part of the Bennett jewelry. I recognized it. From the description in the papers. Why didn't you notify us? Well, I was hoping to find the rest of it first. I waited till she went to work and then came up here. Well, we know about the ring. It was reported from the pawn shop where she hocked it. Oh, well, then she's our girl, all right. Take a look at this bank book. Miss Kramer. All right, she has a bank book. What's so strange about it? Deposit of $1,000 made yesterday. That's what's so strange about it. Where'd you get that? In the desk there. And you tell me she couldn't make a payment of eight bucks on a coat? It doesn't add up, does it? Why, with this bank book and the ring, we can throw the works at her. Fix the room up, boys. Where are you going? To pick up the Kramer girl, of course. Come on. OK, boys, load up. I got to fix this lock. So long. See you later, Benson. Yeah. Why don't you come along, Benson? This is your show, you know. Well, thanks, Lieutenant, but uh, I've got something to attend to first. OK, but you better hurry up. You might miss the fun. Don't worry, I wouldn't miss this. Not for 10,000 bucks, I wouldn't. I see what you mean. So long. So long. Come in and close the door, Benson. I was wondering if you'd tie me up with the Kramer kid in those references. Took me a little time, but I remembered. You can turn around now. And you can put that gun away. You're not going to shoot anybody. That depends, Benson. You know what I want. You don't think I'd be sap enough to bring the junk here, do you? Then get moving and take me to it. Put that away and sit down. You and I are going to talk business. I'll make you a proposition. What makes you think I'll listen? Because you're that kind of a guy, Doc. Only you ain't really a doc. You're a phony. And what's more, you killed Mrs. Alton Bennett. Uh-uh, Doc. That'd only make two murders with nothing to show for it. All right. I'm willing to trade. But first, I'd like to know how you found out about the Bennetts and my intentions. <laughs> Kind of funny how it happened. I stole Bennett's dream from your files and started out to do the job myself. I didn't know you had the same idea. I was waiting for the Bennett dame to come home when I discovered that somebody else was tailing it. I didn't know it was you at first. I couldn't help noticing that whoever it was, he was watching that apartment house the same as me. He came by a couple of times. And then when a taxi drove up, he walked down the street fast, like he didn't want to be caught there, and stopped by a lamppost near the corner. I figured something was up when you started hot-footing it toward that pool hole on the corner. That was when it hit me that maybe somebody else had the same idea I had. So I followed you. And holy smoke, it was you, Doc. 
Well, it didn't take no great brain to figure out what you were up to. So I says to myself, take it easy, Benson. Let Doc do it. I knew he was phoning the Bennett woman. He wanted to get in the easy way. When you got back, there I was ready for you. With an armload of groceries I picked up in an all-night delicatessen. Remember? You fell for it and held the door open for me. There was a couple standing in the lobby. Remember the damn saying no in 14 languages? you'd have when you came out. Why did you kill her, Doc? Why didn't you just tie a handkerchief over your mug and stick her up? Afraid she'd recognize you? Never mind about that. Where's the jewelry? We'll get to that later. First, we have an understanding. Do we or do we not stick together? Stick together for what? Well, look, the police will keep stumbling around until they dig up something. Maybe on you, maybe on me. So? So, we need somebody to hang this on. We build a case against the Kramer kid. A good case, but not too solid. I've already laid the groundwork. At the right time... At the right time, the police find the stolen jewelry in Kramer's apartment and she takes the rap. What do we get out of that? Well, we save our necks and collect ten grand for recovering the stolen goods. We can cash in for 40,000. Don't kid yourself. There ain't a fence in town that'll handle this junk with a murder rap hanging over it. I know. I tried. All right, so I take it out of town. What do you suppose I risk my neck for? Now, hold it, Doc. We play it my way, or we don't play. All right. What's the next step? Tonight, bring me those phony references I fixed up for the Kramer cat. It'll take more than forged references to pin this deal on her. I don't need them for that. I've got the Bennett jewels, remember? I want those references for myself. Now, get out. I've got important business to attend to. Tonight, Doc, about nine. All right. I'll be here at nine. So you worked for this Los Angeles doctor four years. And then he died. Yes. This looks like an all-night affair. I think I'll call the missus and have her put the dinner in the oven. From natural causes, I suppose. Well, come on, Miss Kramer. What killed him? He committed suicide. Oh, he committed suicide. Are you sure he wasn't murdered? He left a note. He left a note, but he didn't leave anybody that could give you a reference. Is that it? Dr. Citron worked alone. Well, what's the matter with his wife? Why couldn't she give you a reference? She didn't like me. You and the doc weren't too timing her, were you? No. Don't get tough, Dawson. You'll give the department a bad name. I never get tough. You know that. Miss Kramer, you deposited $1,000 in your bank account yesterday. That's right. Where'd you get it? I told you. Well, tell me again. Carl Benson gave it to me to deposit for it. Well, what do you say to that, Benson? Carl. Well, Benson. Well, I appreciate the compliment, kitten, but I never had a thousand dollars at one time in my life. 
suppose. This was no joking matter. Well, I'm not joking, kitten. You've got to think up a better one than that. Miss Kramer, I'll give you one more chance to change your story. Where did you get the money? I told you. He gave it to me yesterday morning. He said he was afraid to keep it, that he might spend it all at once. Carl, you know that's the truth. <laughs> Look, fellas, I've known this kid only six weeks. Now, I ask you. I'm dumb, sure, but do you think I'd be dopey enough to trust it with a thousand dollars? If I had it? Carl, you don't know what you're doing to me. These men think I'm mixed up in the Bennett murder. That thousand, that, that money. Please tell them you gave it to me. I'm sorry, kitten. If you'd tip me off in time, I'd have cooked up a story for you. But hitting me cold like this, what else can I do but tell the truth? Why, you... You take over, Wilson. <laughs> Tough nut, that kid. She can think up more lies than the diplomat. Did it ever occur to you she might be telling the truth? Oh, come on, chum, please. She'll break any minute now. You gonna book her? Well, when I do, I want an ironclad case. I get it. You won't have an ironclad case until more of the stolen jewelry turns up, huh? That's right. I wish we'd done a better job on an apartment of hers. Why, she could have an elephant hidden there. What do you say if I give it the once over? Say, that's an idea. While we keep the dame entertained here, you give her place a thorough shakedown. If you do the job right, there's no telling what you might turn up. Leave it to me, Lieutenant. You got a key? Sure. I still got a skeleton I packed when I was on the force. Well, get going. We'll wait here till we hear from you. And if you find anything, we'll be right over. Right. Hey, did you sign those papers yet? What papers? Why, those. Here's a pen. Oh. Let's see. Yeah, yeah. That's right there. Ah, oh. where the cross is, right? All right. Uh-huh. Uh, right there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, there. No, not there. Uh, uh, that's where I sign, right there. Oh. Uh, mm -hmm. One more. One more, right there. Huh? Yeah. Thank you. Hey, what is that? It's the requisition for the brakes, huh?
me, Bunsen. Tie him up in the handkerchief and hand him to me. Don't be a fool, Doc. This junk will land you in the chair. I mean business. Hand them to me. Dawson speaking. Yes? You did? Good boy, Benson. I had a feeling you'd find something. In the overstuffed chair, huh? Well, what do you know? Now, look, Benson. We want the girl there when we recover the jewelry. We'll let her go and then stake out her place. When she goes in, we'll give her a little time and then we'll pick her up. Understand? Right. Turn the Kramer girl loose. Okay, Chief. Barry, pick up your people and we'll meet you over there. What are you doing here? Waiting for you, kitten. Want to talk to you. After what happened today, I don't want to have anything more to do with you, ever. Get out. Take it easy, kitten. I want to do you a favor. I can just imagine. I mean it. I know a lawyer who works angles. If you give me that thousand you banked for me, I can get him to take your case. Oh, so that's it. You want your thousand dollars back. Well, you're not going to get it. Not now. 
You told Lieutenant Dawson you didn't give it to me, remember? Better give it to me, kitten. Uh-uh. Not if my life depended on it. That's just it. Your life does depend on it. I don't see how. I still don't understand. Stop playing dumb, kitten. You know what's in that chair just as well as I do. You. You murdered Mrs. Bennett. You killed her. The sparklers will be found in your possession, kitten. You'll have a hard time explaining that. Don't you come near me. It all ties together now. You've given me the thousand dollars to bang for you. Planning the ring in my apartment. Telling me to sell it so it would be traced back to me through the police. You got it all figured out, haven't you, Karen? No, I... I can't understand why you're doing this to me. I, I've never hurt you. Somebody has to be the fall guy. Somebody always has to be the fall guy in a case like this. And anyway, the cops were already breathing down your neck. Take it easy, kitten. I don't want to get rough with you unless I have to. You're going to stay right here until Dawson comes. You can't get away with this, Carl. I'll tell him things I've never said before. I'll tell him it was you who forged those references for me. How you tried to pump me for information concerning Dr. Redmond's clients. That you knew all about Mrs. Bennett's jewelry and, and her husband's dreams. I'll tell him everything I know, and when I can't tell the truth anymore, I'll start lying like you did. I'll tell him that you told me you were going to rob Mrs. Bennett, and you offered to split the money with me if I'd give you information. They'll take you too, Carl! You're right, kitten. I gotta change my plans. Instead of finding you here, they'll find you lying in the alley, a suicide. You wouldn't! When they ask me how it happened, I'll tell them you jumped out the window when you learned you were gonna be arrested. <laughs> All right, boy, let's go. Coop, you cover the fire escape with fail. You fellas come up with me. Take her downstairs. I'm sorry. Really sorry. Take it easy, kid. Is everything here? Uh, yeah, everything except the diamonds that Charlie bought. Charlie? Who's Charlie? The keymaker downstairs. 
We've been watching them a long time. This afternoon, we picked them up. <laughs> Only six weeks in town, and she locates a fence. Brother. Oh, no. Charlie didn't buy them from Miss Kramer. No? Then who? Sergeant, get Baird. Mr. Baird, please. Mr. Baird, did you ever see this man before? Yes, he's the same man I saw loitering near the entrance to Mrs. Bennett's apartment building. The night I brought her home. Thanks. That's all. Hey, wait a minute. What's going on here? Phil, bring in Mr. Boyd and Miss Lake. No. Mr. Boyd, Miss Lake, please. Miss Lake, Mr. Boyd, did you ever see this man before? Why, yes. You showed us his picture in that lineup of policemen who'd been dropped from the force. Of course. He's the man who came in the Crayford Arms lobby with a bundle of groceries. I'm positive. He dropped a package and I picked it up for him. Okay, so I was there. I was following the Benadame for Doc Redman. That's a lie. It's true. I swear it is. That's right, Benson. Keep on and you'll lie yourself right into the chair. You're under arrest. Under arrest? For what? For breaking the health and sanitation laws. You got a nasty habit of sticking gum in public places. Stop clowning, Lieutenant. What's the charge? Why, you poor dumb fool. Murder. Murder? No. No, I didn't kill a Benadame. It was Doc Redmond who killed him. Let me go, I can prove it. The doc's your man. The doc. <laughs> He's dead. Yep. I've never known a congenital wise guy yet that didn't outsmart himself. He always bared down too hard. Now you take that ring, for instance. Well, the minute it showed up, I knew it was a plant. And who else but Benson? If you'll stop patting yourself on the back two seconds, I'll tell you something. We're gonna have new brakes tomorrow. Oh, yeah? Say, that's fine. Do you think these will hold out till tomorrow? I had to give these up to get new ones. You never saw so much red tape. You mean now? This very moment? We, this car? Shh, shh. They don't know. Won't hurt them. Look, sweetheart. I don't want to appear to be inquisitive or anything like that. But just how do you propose to stop this buggy? Oh, we'll worry about that when the time comes. How does it feel now? I feel like I've had Novocaine. You think you could eat something? I know a great big Italian restaurant on 3rd Avenue. Uh-oh, time's come. Start worrying. <laughs> 